Hey there, everybody. This is a lesson for my intro calc students. Uh, this is our second or third class now on the first derivative test. I thought we'd do a few more examples before we moved on. Um, so the first example here is it says use the first derivative test to find all the maxima and minima and provide a sketch for this function. Notice that we bounded this function. So um, first thing I guess we'll do is we'll find the critical points which could be maximums or minimums, and then we'll use the interval test to see if they in fact are. So we're going to need to do the derivative of this. And we haven't done this in a while. We're going to need the quotient rule for this. So let's see. So that's low times the derivative of the high, low d high, minus high d low. So the derivative of the bottom is 2x minus 2, all divided by the denominator squared. So there we go. First time we've had to use quotient rule in a while. And this thing simplifies. Uh, I'm not going to bother expanding the denominator. That's simple enough, I think. But the numerator simplifies down to 2 minus x squared. So those will be the two factors that I use. I thought I'd do another example today where the factors that uh, we have here divide each other. Because notice that the rules for division are the same as they are for multiplication, right? If you multiply a positive by a positive or a negative by a negative, oops, you get a positive. And if you multiply a positive by a negative or a negative by a positive, you get a negative. And notice the same is true of divide. If you divide two positives or divide two negatives, oh boy, drawing badly here, you get a positive. But if it's one of each, you get a negative. So notice that you can do an interval test the same way with a division factored problem that you can with a multiply factored problem. Okay, so critical points happen either when this thing has um, uh, either a slope of zero or the slope doesn't exist. Now, the only reason the slope wouldn't exist would be if there was some sort of asymptote or some sort of non-permissible value. But if you remember from uh, grade 11, you learned that from the quadratic formula, the b squared minus 4ac part, called the determinant, can determine whether there are any solutions at all. So are there any numbers that would make this zero at all? And in fact, there isn't. Because b squared minus 4 ac would be negative 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 1 times 2, which is 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. So the fact that the discriminant, sorry, yeah, the discriminant, did I call it a determinant? Sorry, it's a discriminant. The discriminant is a negative, means that you can't square root a negative, so there are no asymptotes. So this thing is continuous probably forever, but for sure, between these two boundary points. So that means that I don't have to worry about any critical values that I might miss because this thing doesn't exist or the slope of this thing doesn't exist somewhere. So all I got to worry about is where this, the slope is zero. And if the slope of this thing is zero, then notice that this big, ugly, non-factorable, no asymptote denominator just goes away, right? You just multiply both sides of the equation by that denominator and then you get x is equal to plus or minus root two. Okay, we haven't had a critical point that was a radical yet in our examples, but that's okay. We ain't afraid of no radicals. We can, we can work with that. So um, my critical points are x equals plus or minus 2, right? So these are my critical points. And now let's turn those critical points into to critical, or sorry, those are my critical, let me say that again. Those are my critical values, right? So let's turn those into critical points. So my critical points happen... Uh, when those are my x values, and I have to find my y values. So my critical points happen when I have f of root 2. Let's do that one first. So that's going to give me root 2 over 2 minus 2 root 2 plus 2, which is root 2 over uh, 4 minus 2 root 2. And just in case you've forgotten how to do that, you can simplify that. 2 over 4 minus 2 root 2 multiplies like so right, to try to rationalize the denominator, and that's going to give you 4 root 2 plus 4 um, all over 16 minus 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8, so that's 4 root 2 plus 4 over 8, which is um, 1 plus root 2 over 2, so there we go, so that's 1 plus root 2 over 2, so I have the point x is root 2, y is 1 plus root 2 over 2, 
And okay, I'm not going to let you have a calculator when you sketch this graph, so we probably should estimate that as a decimal. I know that the square root of root 2 is about 1.4. It's 1.414 if you really want to uh, be technical. I just remember that from trig because you see that number all the time. And then uh, if I add that to 1, I get 2.414. Divide that by 2, and uh, I get uh, 1.207. So there we go. There's, a, there's our critical point for positive root 2. And then we have a critical point for negative root 2, which is going to be negative root 2 over, again, it's going to be 2, this time plus 2 root 2 over 2, or plus 2. And then that's going to equal... Uh, negative root 2 over 4 plus 2 root 2. And again, I'll, I'll spare you the details this time, but this one simplifies down to 1 minus root 2 over 2. So that means I have the point, I'll say or, uh, negative root 2 comma 1 root minus root 2 over 2, or so that we can estimate this as a decimal, negative 1.414 comma, and this would be then negative so there we have it. There's our, our two critical points. And are those points maximums or minimums? Well, they, they are for sure local maximums and minimums, but are they absolute? Do the endpoints end up either above or below these two things? Well, we could explore our endpoints. If you look back again, the question has a boundary. We are bounded here to negative 2 and 4. So let's find f of 2. And if I run 2 through the formula, I get... Um, 2 over 4 minus 4. Uh, oh, sorry, that'd be plus 4 because it's a negative. So plus 4 um, plus 2. So that's going to be, so f of 2 is going to, or f, actually, I just realized something. It should be a negative 2, shouldn't it? Hang on. Hang on. f of negative 2, that's better. There we go. f of negative 2 is going to be um, negative 2 over 10. So that's negative 1 fifth. So the endpoint is negative 2, negative 1 fifth. And again, maybe since decimals are easier to estimate with on a grid, we'll go 0.2, which, as you can see, is not as low, or is actually, sorry, not as low as our critical value here. So therefore, our critical value is probably an absolute minimum. Let's double check, though. Let's check the other boundary. What was the other boundary again? Was it 4? So 4. The other boundary, the other end point is 4. So let's find out where that end point is. That's 4 over, um, let's see, that'd be 16 minus 8 plus 2, which is 4 tenths. So that's uh, 4 comma uh, 2 fifths, which is, again, 4 comma 0.4. And that is not nearly as high as what I get at my critical value, which is 1.2 and change. So therefore, I've now made the determination, therefore, um, this 1.414 comma 1.207 is an absolute uh, max, and negative 1.414 comma negative 0.207 is my absolute min over this interval. So there we go. So I have the highest point I can get, the lowest point I can get, and a couple of endpoints. Oh, and you know the other thing I know? Y-intercepts are often easy to find, and this one's no exception. Obviously, if x is 0, 0 divided by anything is 0. So let's start there. It goes through 0, 0. And then, like I said, we know that we at, at root 2, which is about 1.4, so negative 1, negative 1.5, so negative 1.4 is about, say, there. We dip down to about 0.2. So this is 0.5, so it's not quite halfway, so maybe somewhere around there. And then at negative 2, the end point, uh, I'm just a slight bit higher than that. So that, that, on this scale, that would be even hard to see, but this is definitely down, and then it goes up. And then what does it do after that? Well, at, again, 1.414 positive, so 1.5 is here, so a little bit to the left, it goes up to 1.2, so it goes up to 1, and then this would be 1.25, so I don't know, maybe around there-ish, there-ish. And then what does it do after that? Well, it doesn't get to zero. Um, again, I don't think, but it's okay. I, I know what it does at four, right? My end point is that it goes down, it dips down to 0.4. So by four, here's 0.5, so it's a little below that, so it does something like this. Something like that. So there we go. 
Um, feel free to enter this equation into Desmos and see that I think I've got a pretty good graph. I might, I might have uh, not sloped down fast enough here, but overall I think that's probably about right. And if you're wondering, well, what would have happened to this thing if we hadn't bounded it? What if it was if it kept on going this way and it kept on going that way? And actually, we'll learn how to use limits again. Remember limits from chapter one? To learn more about that um, in the rest of this chapter. But for now, that's as good a curve as we're going to sketch with the information we're given. We knew that this point here was our absolute minimum, and we learned that this point here was our absolute maximum. So if a question asks you for the final answers uh, in exact form, there they are as exact numbers. But if I have to put them on a graph, it's kind of easier if I estimate them as decimals to, to sketch them. So there's our first example. For our second example, I wanted one that did something that uh, none of our examples have done before. What if a critical value actually isn't a maximum or minimum? So we have ourselves a quartic. What do we know quartics do? Quartics have two arms that go up if their A value is positive. So that means that for sure there is no absolute maximums, right? Because we're not bounded anywhere. There's no boundary after this one. So there's no absolute maximums, but there could be a local maximum. And there could, of course, be a local and an absolute minimum. So let's see if we can find them. So first we find the derivative, 4x cubed minus 12x squared. And then we set the derivative to zero to find our uh, places where we have critical values. And again, you could also have critical values where this thing doesn't exist, but it's a continuous polynomial function. It exists everywhere. So set this to zero and start factoring. I could take out a 4x squared out of these two things, and that leaves me with an x minus 3. And that, uh, that tells me everything I need to know. I need to know that x is 0 is a critical number and x is 3 is a critical number. And the fact that this is a quartic, but I only have two critical values, already gets me thinking that this thing maybe doesn't have two different places where there's going to be minimums. Um, we might only end up having one max-min kind of a combination here. So let's see what this thing does when we do our interval chart. By the way, I kind of forgot to do the, you know what, I'm going to just back up. I'm sorry. I forgot to do the interval chart for this one, didn't I? Okay. How did I know about <laughs> what this shape was? Well, I mean, I guess I should have done this. Let me, let me just backtrack and do the interval chart for this one. My apologies. I'm a little scatterbrained today. Okay. So what were the numbers again for x? My critical values are plus and minus root 2. So what happens when you are smaller than negative root 2? What happens when you're between negative root 2 and positive root 2? And what happens when you're bigger than root 2? I already know what this thing looks like because it was kind of easy to figure out once I knew my critical points. But I actually kind of just glossed over the fact that I knew it was going this direction. I, I probably should have figured out whether I was increasing or decreasing using my chart. So let's do that. Okay. So what are my two factors again? My two factors are, go back to here, the factored form right here. This is my, my factored form. So I have a factor of 2 minus x squared on top. And I have a factor of, uh, what was it, x squared plus 2x plus 2 on the bottom, or is it minus 2x? Whatever. You know what, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, because it's being squared. This is always positive, because you can't square something and get a negative. So I really only have to worry about this column. So what happens when I have a number smaller than root 2? How about, um, uh, well, negative 2 is smaller than root 2, or, or negative 3 is even smaller than that. So if I put in, so if I put in negative 2 or negative 3, this thing's definitely negative. If I put in something like uh, a between 2 and negative 2, how about 0? Well, this thing is 2 minus 0, which is, which is positive. Um, and if I put in a number that's bigger than root 2, like say, I don't know, 2 is bigger than root 2, this thing ends up negative again. So I end up going from a, uh, let's see, so that makes that my, my, I am decreasing, and then I'm increasing, and, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I should make that negative, positive, negative, and then on the next, what's the function doing? Sorry about that. So this one's definitely a negative, so it's decreasing. This one's a positive, so it's increasing. This one's a negative, so it's decreasing. So between uh, my end point and negative 2, I am definitely decreasing, which I am. I'm going down. That's why this thing's a minimum, even though it's a really very, uh, very slight minimum. Then I go up. I'm increasing when I get to root 2, and then I'm decreasing after it. So this thing's definitely a local maximum, which I kind of knew from, from my numbers. But there you go. 
the interval chart is something you should do. Okay, let's go back to the second one again. So in the second one, I'm doing my interval chart for um, smaller than zero, between zero and three, and past three. So my two factors are, I don't have to worry about the four. The four doesn't change anything. I just have to worry about the variable. So that's x squared and x minus three. And once again, because I'm squaring one of my factors, there is no way it can turn out to be anything but positive. But x minus three when you're smaller than zero is negative. But pick a number between zero and three, like two, and you're still negative. That hasn't happened to us till now. Okay, so anyway, when x is bigger than three, you're positive. So my slope overall here is downward, downward, and upward, which means that my function is decreasing, then it's decreasing still, and then it's increasing. This is new. What do you mean it's decreasing, but it's still decreasing after a critical point? Well, because there is no um, upper boundaries on these numbers, I, I, I do know that, uh, uh, let's, find, let's find the value of these numbers, f of zero, is one, because if I just run zero through that, I get one, so zero, one is one of my points, okay? And then, um, but, but zero, one doesn't seem to be, right, when you get to zero for x, you're decreasing, then you're still decreasing, so it's, it's neither a maximum nor a minimum. Uh, f of three turns out to be, if you plug three into this formula, you end up getting negative 26. So three comma negative 26, you're decreasing on the way to that point, you're increasing after that point, that is definitely an absolute, I should say is, an absolute minimum. Okay, and how do I know that it's a minimum? Well, because I know that the arms are going up and this thing's decreasing on its way there, so that's the lowest that the graph can go. But what about this point here? I'll say but um, zero comma one is neither a max nor a min because there, oops, wrong there. Oh, no, that's right there. There is no change in the direction of slope at x equals zero, right? Our interval table told us. When you head to zero from the left, you're going down as a slope. When you head to it from the right, or leave it from the right, going down. What's this point doing? So, oops. So what's going on at zero comma one? According to the interval chart, it's decreasing from the left. It's still, I should say, it's still decreasing. That's a typo. It's still decreasing as you leave that point and head to the right. So what's it doing? Well, in the next section, we'll learn that zero, one is neither a maximum nor a minimum. It's called a point of inflection. At the point zero, one, the curve changes shape without changing direction. So what it does is it looks something like this. If this is the point uh, zero comma one, it's coming towards it like that and then it's leaving like that. So notice that the slope everywhere as I approach this, is always slightly downward, and same thing afterwards. So the slopes don't change direction, but the curve's shape does. You'll learn in the next section that we call this part of the curve concave up, and we call this part of the curve concave down. And uh, note, again, what I just drew in the purple, that all tangents on either side of zero, 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 001 are negative. So there's no change in the slope's direction. There's no change in the direction of all of its tangents. So that means that when I graph this thing at zero comma one, and this, oh, I've got an ugly scale here, right? This is like two and a half, five, so okay, so so this is two and a half, so one would be like less than halfway, so there. So at that point there, the armature of this thing, 
curves towards it, but then it curves away. Now, where does it go after that? Well, it goes all the way down to the one point that I know, which is, what was it again? It was 3 and negative 26, which is my absolute minimum. So at 3, 3, negative 26. So again, this is 25. That's 27 and a half, so maybe about there. So we, we, we curve down, we hit that, and then we go back up, and we do something like that. I think I might have exaggerated how wide that is. I didn't have any other points. This would be a tough one to actually find x-intercepts for because this thing uh, doesn't factor even when you get it into uh, its first derivative or whatever. So it's, uh, um, yeah, there is such a thing as a cubic and a quartic formula, just like there's a quadratic formula, but make sure you have a computer to help you in an afternoon to kill before you start playing with the quartic formula. I, I think if I really had to make an example of this where I had to come up with a really accurate graph of this, I would just put table of value numbers in and find out that, hey, when I plugged in, of course, when zero is my, my critical value, but when I plug in one, I'm like really negative. So I know it, and I know if zero is positive one. So I just know that the x-intercept happens between here and here. I know it can't change directions again after this, so I know there's no more x-intercepts there. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling I did this too wide. I think the x-intercept, I remember seeing this graph before, is closer to four. In fact, it might even be before four. I think it might be. Eh, oh well, don't worry about it. Anyway, we could actually take a look at it on Desmos if you like. Why don't we do that? Let's go to Desmos and see what these graphs look like, see how close my sketches are, right? They call this stuff curve sketching. We should be able to sketch some curves. So let's see, if I were to go, I think I still have these saved from when I did them before. Do, 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 do. Yep, there it is. Here's the one we're looking at right now. So let me move it over so you can see it. There you go. So if I sketch that, there it is. Yeah, I was right. I made it a little too wide. But there's that point of an inflection where it changes direction without, well, that's not true. The curve changes shape without actually changing direction. And yeah, that x-intercept is some sort of uh, fraction. And this one too. Oh, maybe it's exactly four. Oh, no, it's not quite exactly four. Anyway, at the first example we did um, was this guy here. Uh, no, that's the same one. This guy here. And uh, remember this one here turned out to be that cute little curve there from there to there. And there you go. That's, uh, that's how you do kind of weirder looking curves on the curve sketching. Okay, I'll end the video there. So that's it for the two examples we're going to do today. Uh, you're still working on the 4.3 uh, assignment. Thanks for watching.